right, so it's 12 o'clock. It looks like the room's pretty full, the door's closed. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Feel free to keep eating. Um, so I am Kate Saylor. I'm an informationist at the Taubman Health Sciences Library here at University of Michigan. Uh, I work mostly with the School of Nursing, School of Public Health, and the Department of Pediatrics. I primarily work as an information or a subject specialist, so I do a lot of instruction. I work with students, faculty, staff, and researchers. And I'd say just over the last couple years, I've been doing a little bit more with research data management and a little bit with data visualization. Uh, and I'm Justin Jock. Oops. I'm the data visualization librarian here at the University of Michigan's library. Um, and I have my background, I have a master's in information science that was pretty sort of computationally heavy. Um, but then I also have a PhD in media studies. So I, I'm really interested both in terms of like the computational work that goes into data visualization, but then also sort of questions of aesthetics and representation. Um, so I really like working and thinking about data visualization because I feel like it's really at this sort of intersection of you know storytelling and how we understand the world and then also just uh, getting my hands dirty and like playing around with data and stuff like that so, so yeah so we're going to be talking about uh, data stories in visual form or data visualization uh, we're going to go back and forth so I'll talk a little bit Justin will talk a little bit I'll talk a little bit and Justin will wrap it up um, so we're going to do a little introduction to like what is data and how can it be used to tell a story. We'll look at some different types of di uh, data visualizations and maybe how to make decisions on which type is the best for your data. Uh, we'll look at some basic design principles. So hopefully the visualizations that you're creating are communicating the story that you really want to tell. Um, and then we'll do some, it looks like a few of you guys have laptops, which is great, because we do have some demos and hopefully some time for some hands-on stuff um, using mm -hmm. tools to create visualizations. So I'm going to start out with talking about what is data. There are so many different definitions for data. It seems like they all combine these three components. So kind of the, the collection process, is it observed, is it collected? So how is the data actually gathered? Um, there are descriptions of the data, so maybe it's a list of things. Maybe it's data as text files, data as numbers, data as images, so descriptions of the data itself. And then a lot of the definitions include kind of the purpose or what the end process is for the data. So I have a few to just kind of walk through here. Uh, so this one's looking at facts and statistics. So again, it's kind of describing the data itself. And it's collected for the purpose of reference or analysis. So again, it's a, the thing itself and then why we're collecting it or what we're going to do with it. Um, this one's focused on research data. And again, it's collected, observed, or created for the purposes of analysis to produce original research results. This one's looking at data um, as materials, so that's a, a pretty broad description of the thing that's generated or collected during the course of conducting research. Um, then we can get into some more nitty gritty definitions and you'll see these coming from a lot of funders with regards to things like data management plans or data sharing requirements. What are they actually requiring you to share? How are they defining data? So this one came out of the White House. Uh, it's looking at factual material um, that's necessary to validate research findings. This one's interesting because it's telling us what data is not, according to their definition. Uh, it's not preliminary analyses, drafts of scientific papers, peer reviews, communications, and in this case, it's not physical specimens, physical objects. Whereas this definition is looking at data as a representation of information, and again, we have that purpose for communicating, interpretation, or processing, this one gives us a list of things that data is, so sequence of bits, tables of numbers, and then this one actually defines specimens or physical objects as data. So there's a huge diversity in definitions of data. This is probably my favorite because it's just so simple and inclusive, so really anything that you can perform analysis on. So the reason I'm going through all of these definitions is really um, all of the things that influence these de uh, definitions, all of the factors that come into play when you're defining data are also things that are going to come into play when you make a visualization. So in trying to tie this back to storytelling, when you're collecting data, thinking about the characters involved. So who is being studied? What community is being studied? Who's actually doing the resource, research or the data collection? 
who's funding the research, who's benefiting from all of this data collection. Uh, the setting is another important factor, factor, so the time and place of the research impacts the definition of data and it will also impact how you visualize the data. Uh, the process, how is the data collected, the method for analysis, and the method for dis dissemination, again, influences the definition of data and it will influence how you visualize that data. And then kind of the guts of all of this is the story. Like what type of story are you trying to tell with your data? So again, context is key with all of these things. Um, so what exactly is data visualization? It can be a lot of things. Again, lots and lots of definitions. But simply defined, it's mapping data, any of those data definitions that we talked about, in a visual space. You can have very simple types of data visualization. Uh, we've been visualizing data even way before this, but this is back from the World's Fair um, in 1900. This is just a hand-drawn visualization of black life. So no high-tech software or computing, any, no big data, very simplified data visualization. You know, compared to things that we see generated now, using software like Tableau, we can create these really complex interactive dashboards. So all of these things are data visualization. Uh, this was a funny example that Justin actually showed me. This was a, a visualization uh, back uh, in 2012 from Subway. And so this is when they were launching all of these, <laughs> like fresh avocado on your subs. And in the commercial, they had this visualization, which <laughs> it's not very clear what they're trying to visualize, but they're taking advantage of the power of visualizations to try to make it seem like fresh avocados are really important or really powerful. <laughs> um, and so they're saying, this was a quote from Subway saying that, you know, the upward positive trend is related to the taste. So this is a silly example of data visualization, but um, it just, it speaks to kind of the power. People want to use data visualization to tell stories. So why do we use data visualization? Um, I love this quote. Uh, so the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. So one of the, the major advantages to using data visualization is that it actually takes advantage of a different part of your brain. So I could show you a spreadsheet full of numbers, and I'm sure with time and a little guidance we could kind of parse out the data and figure out exactly what it's trying to tell us. That's a very slow process that takes place in a different part of the brain. I can convert that data into a visual format and it's going to move over to a much more efficient part of our brain so I can kind of process and understand that information a lot more quickly and efficiently. Data visualization is also really helpful in helping us learn about the data. There's a lot of data stories that kind of go on behind the scenes that may not be immediately obvious when we're just looking at like a table of numbers. There's some uh, main categories or reasons for um, visualizing data around discovery, hypothesis generation, analysis, and communication. Um, and this kind of breaks down into two main categories. So we have exploratory visualizations that kind of help that data generator learn about their own data. Um, and again, those tied to the discovery, hypothesis, and analysis. This is a really interesting data set. Anybody that works with data visualization has probably seen this, but I love it because it's a great example of how um, visualizing data really changes the way that we understand it. So at first glance, we see this table of numbers. You can kind of see there's four different sets of numbers. We have an X and Y variable. We can kind of skim through the numbers. We see they're all you know, positive numbers, maybe within a range of 15 or 20 points from one another. I don't see any major outliers. I don't really notice any trends. Maybe I, you know, I see a lot of this like eight, 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 eight. So that's, that's interesting, but I, I really don't know much about this data just from looking at the numbers. So then I can actually run some uh, statistical analysis on these numbers. And when we're looking at things like the mean and variance, again, the numbers don't look that different, but if we convert each data set and plot it out into a graph, we can see that they're actually very, very different data sets. We would completely have missed the relationships and the trends in each of these data sets if we hadn't created a visualization to look at it or explore the data. Um, so this is called Anscom, Anscom's quartet, um, and he stated that 
Um, in addition to doing some of that statistical analysis, it's very important to also create a visual of that data because we can see and learn so much more about that data when it's actually um, plotted out. So then the other category for data visualization is explanatory, so communication. So this is kind of after you've done your analysis and your exploratory work, now you want to commu communicate that information to a viewer or to a consumer. So that's a slightly different category of visualization. And so to tie this all back to storytelling, um, that's going to be more along the lines of that um, explanatory and communication. So again, the type of data that you're collecting is really going to influence the type of story that you can tell. Um, humans are natural born storytellers. We've been telling stories forever. We start telling stories as soon as we can talk. Um, and so it only makes sense that now we have all of this data and these cool tools to make visualizations that we would naturally gravitate towards using that to tell stories or improve our stories. And again, tying this all back to context, this is key when you're creating your visualization. You need to think about who is your audience? What are the best ways and methods for you to communicate your data through visualization? What story are you trying to tell and why are you trying to tell this story? So for your audience, you want to make sure that you're matching your visualization to your viewer's needs. So if you're teaching a class to a bunch of you know, K through 12 students, that's going to be one particular type of visualization, potentially. Or maybe you're trying to communicate um, some type of data to policymakers or government. You're trying to influence change. That could be a very different type of um, visualization. What does your audience already know? Right? If you're throwing these really advanced visualizations to you know, fifth graders, are they going to be able to process what you're trying to tell them? Um, and then what additional information does your audience need to know to understand the story that you're trying to tell? Um, I love um, Alberto Cairo. Uh, he actually just came out with a book um, recently about how charts lie. Um, and I love it because he kind of breaks down these common myths when it comes to data visualization. And so you hear over and over again that a picture is worth a thousand words and data should speak for itself. Yeah, but the problem is if your viewer doesn't know how to read it, then it doesn't really work well. So you should never assume that your visualization is self-explanatory. You have to provide enough context and information for that user to know what to do with it. The data does not speak for itself. This is a really simplified version of providing some context. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this project. It's called Dear Data. It's a very cool project between these two information designers where they took an entire year and outlined weekly themes for different data projects. Um, they had postcards. So on one side of the postcard, they would draw a visualization. I think this one's talking about doors, like what types of doors do they walk through during that week. Um, and so they would each try to gather that data. And then on the back side of the card, they provide context and a little instruction for how you can interpret that. Like if I just saw that the front side of that postcard, I would have no idea what that is. It doesn't communicate any information to me. But I see on the back side of the card a little bit of context. It kind of tells me that I have a legend to look at, and it gives me a little instruction on how to read it. Um, so that's a very cool project. Um, let's see here, I'm going to try to open up. I want to show some of these things um, live. I did grab screenshots of everything because technology always fails whenever I try to do this. Um, so this is another much more advanced kind of high-tech interactive way to provide context for your audience. So this is um, uh, data from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. They have the most amazing data visualizations. And actually, this one was just published a few days ago. Um, so this is looking at precision mapping to end child death. And so I can navigate through this. It's entirely digital, online. I don't need to download any you know, software to navigate this data. This product is actually holding my hand, walking me through all of these visualizations. So it's giving me context, why these things are important, what should I be paying attention to. It's explaining all of the visualizations. And so this is great. Like, you can give someone a chart, but this is giving me so much more context. It's telling me what's important, what should I be paying attention to. It's giving me that additional context, kind of the background story. 
And I mean, they use everything. We have like charts and tables. We have um, some GIS data that's pulled in. Breaks down what all the different colors mean. Um, we can zoom in on this country. I won't go through the whole thing because it's pretty long, but um, I just love that it will do uh, one more um, map comparison. So I mean, again, this is just tons of data. I might, it might take me a minute to process this on my own, but providing all of this additional context just really helps the viewer understand the story that you're trying to tell. So I just love this transition. It's going from maps and converting it into this distribution data. I mean, it's just an incredible visualization. Um, so that's IHME. They do some really cool stuff. So making sure that your audience has enough information to understand and process the story you're trying to tell. Sure, we're doing okay on time. And then the medium. How are you going to tell that story? What methods, what tools um, are you, are you printing things out? Is it a poster? Is it going to be an image in a journal article? So we have static visualizations. So the viewer can look at this and they can interpret it, but there's no other way for them to interact with it or engage with it. Still, it's very useful. We have things like this plugged into websites. You'll see, see things uh, printed out and hung on walls. You see journal articles that all use these static visualizations. This is actually another really cool one I like to show live. This is a, a wind map. So this is a dynamic visualization. So this has real-time wind data coming in that's changing this visualization. Um, as, oh, I keep bumping this microphone. Um, I can zoom in so the viewer is able to kind of not fully manipulate the data, but I can kind of zoom in and get a little more detailed information. So maybe I want to look at Ann Arbor data. I can hover, I get a little more data. So this is a dynamic visualization. And then this one's cool. I'm not sure if the, the audio, what the audio situation is up here, but um, let's see if I can turn it up just in case. You can hear it a little bit. So again, this is a dynamic visualization. There's not really anything I can do to manipulate it, but this is showing live edits on Wikipedia. You hear these like chimes, and the chimes are things that are being edited. The kind of uh, string plunk sound is things that are being deleted. Um, uh, you can kind of see the size of the circles that are coming in. So if it's a, a very large, significant edit, it'll have a bigger circle. I can click on any one of these things, and it will take me over to Wikipedia and show me what that actual um, edit is. But again, this is another example of a dynamic visualization. And again, we're thinking about medium, like how are you communicating this message? This one I might have to come back to. Sometimes it takes a minute to load. Um, so this is an interactive visualization. This was created using Tableau. Um, it's a very cool visualization. So without even interacting with it, maybe I'll zoom down so we can see it. Yeah, there we go. Without interacting with anything yet, I can kind of see there's a color scale. So the animals that are green, and this is focused on endangered species in Africa, the animals that are green are of least concern. The animals that are red are critically endangered. We can also see by the direction that the animal's facing, if it's facing to the left, the population's decreasing. If it's facing to the right, the population's increasing. And then if I click on any one of these animals, this is where sometimes it's a little bit slow. I can get more information about that particular animal. So we're looking at a black rhino. You'll see that it actually pulls, whoop, it pulls that data and maps it so we can see where in Africa they are. Um, so this is a very cool interactive visualization. Then I have one more example I want to show you. So it's called World Shape. And so this will let you compare different countries. Um, and they have this kind of uh, sh like shape here with all of these different um, variables. So looking at like education level, living standards, workplace equality, health. Um, you can see that I can pick different countries here. So maybe I want to roll in you know, India into this comparison.
the white is the world, and then you'll see the different countries are um, different colors. And then I can actually interact with this data. Again, if I want to look at you know, the data back in 1990, so it's going to manipulate the little um, visualization up at the top. And then if I want more um, exact numbers, if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see I have a bar chart at the bottom that gives me the exact numbers that's also responsive to that kind of click and drag through time. Um, so that's an interactive visualization. So you have a lot of option when it, options when it comes to how you want to present your data um, to, your, to your viewers and to your, your users. So again, we keep talking about visualizations being a very powerful way to communicate with your audience. And uh, I will quote Superman here. So with great power comes great responsibility. So this all ties back to kind of ethics, right? Uh, so this is a, a Hippocratic oath I found for visualization. So I shall not use visualization to intentionally hide or confuse the truth, which it is intended to portray. I will respect the great power visualization has in garnering wisdom and misleading the uninformed. I accept this responsibility willfully and without reservation and promise to defend this oath against all enemies, both domestic and foreign. <laughs> <laughs> so this was presented at the um, IEEE Viz Week meeting back in 2011, uh, but I thought that was kind of a, a nice way to, to wrap it up. Um, so I pulled this from um, a blog that I, I think it's fantastic. The blog's called Data Therapy, and this particular blog post is called Aligning Your Data Methods and Your Mission. And uh, this is from the MIT Media Lab, and I thought that they did a really good job explaining problems broadly with data use. And these bleed over into visualization. So things like opaque processes. So the subjects of the data aren't given any insight into what happens with the data that's about them. Um, extractive collection. So the data is pulled from the subjects in their communities by those outside of it. And this is a huge problem and something that community-based participatory research kind of fights against. That's inviting the community into the research teams to make sure that the community is kind of at the table for all of those important discussions. Um, high technological complexity. Fine, you're a researcher with all of this expertise and skills and funding. You collect all of this data. You can give the data back to the community, but are they going to be able to do anything with it? And then control of impact. So the people that the data is about have no say in the impacts of the decision being made with the data. So these are all problematic patterns of data use that feed right into data visualization. And so I've always used this example, this data visualization. So this is um, Dr. John Snow's map of cholera outbreak in 1854. Um, and so what he did was map all of the outbreaks of cholera and tied it into uh, the water pumps. He's kind of the father of modern epidemiology. And I always thought, like, this is a great visualization, right? This is helping the public. This is good for people. He's not harming people, right? It's great. But kind of thinking through this lens, like, he didn't work with any members of the community, right? This is kind of like that extractive collection. He was an outsider collecting data about this community, and then they didn't have any control of impact, right? Like they didn't have any say with what that data, you know, what decisions were being made based on that data. So I'm like, ah, oh, it's still a great, powerful visualization, great use of data visualization, but I'm kind of like thinking about it a little bit differently now. Um, and so kind of a, a counter example to that is this one from the Detroit Geographic Expedition. This um, was from the 1960s. So this was a really interesting project where a group of academic geographers, all of them white men, collaborated with inner city youth in Detroit to create these visualizations. And I just think this is a really interesting example because the youth from Detroit that worked with them helped name all of their visualizations. And I can guarantee that those white male academic geographers were not planning to name their visualizations where commuters run over black children on the points downtown track, right? So this gives the community a lot of power and say in how that data visualization and that data is communicated out to the public. So this is kind of a, a counter to that example of the, the cholera outbreak. Um, some other issues to think about with ethics and data visualization is kind of the, the collection of the data. So what are the conditions that make data visualization possible? Who's funding that data? 
who collected the data, whose labor happened behind the scenes and under what conditions. Lots and lots of white men creating data visualizations. That impacts the kind of story that's being told. Who's benefiting from all of this data being collected and data visualizations generated? Um, even thinking about things like what data is presented and what data is not presented. All of these things can influence kind of the story that you're telling. Um, data analysis is another major issue. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen this website. I love this website. It's hilarious. Um, so he takes two incredibly random variables and combines them and finds what seems to be correlations, but we know that there's nothing connected to the number of people who drown by falling in a pool with Nicolas Cage films, right? But looking at it, you're like, oh, maybe there is a connection. So we, we have a responsibility when we're analyzing the data to make sure that you know, what we're presenting is actu actu actually accurate. Um, so in this case, it is, it is not. Um, another ethical consider consider uh, consideration is the design and like how you're actually presenting the data. And there's all sorts of things like you know color and size and shape and the formats and the things Justin's going to talk about later. Um, but things like this, um, and I will say, there are cases where people are going to use these very powerful data visualization tools because they're powerful and can influence a lot of people and they might not use them for the best reasons, right? There's not much we can do about that. But then there's a lot of people that create visualizations that suffer from these common pitfalls where they're very well-intentioned and they don't mean to mislead people or deceive people. Um, but one common one is changing the baseline. So this is the same exact data, right? 35%, 39.6%, but you'll see in this one, they've changed the baseline to 34%, right? If we look at this, starting at a 0% baseline, it looks very, very different. It's telling a very, very different story. So just making sure that the story you're telling with these data visualizations is, is accurate. Um, I will say too, you know, there's nothing we can do about people that are gonna make these visualizations that are purposefully deceptive. Um, but we can focus on, if you're in any capacity, like teaching students or working on the community, helping people understand uh, thinking critically about data, right? Not only is it good for you and it's going to make your data visualizations better and more honest, but if you can get out in the community and talk to people about these things, and I'll say, you know, we're like in the age of like hashtag fake news and there's lots of um, data that's, you know, poured out that's maybe not so accurate, just really focusing on um, you know, approaching these things with like a, a critical mindset. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, this is another, let me check my time here. Ooh. Just a couple more minutes. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> um, this is kind of another angle to think about um, when we're talking about data visualization. So this is kind of an emerging, emerging area within data visualization. Um, applying feminist theory to data visualization. This is a great article, but um, I did pull just a few bullet points from a blog post that the author um, published called What Would Feminist Data Visualization Look Like? And I really, really like this because um, I think it frames the, the data storytelling more as like a conversation. So when you're putting this data visualization out in the world, how can we talk back to the data? Is there a way to question it? Um, are you presenting alternative, alternative realities um, and views when you're presenting this data visualization? Um, and so, I really, really like this example. Um, I want to show it to you live. Hopefully it works. Um, but this one was, ah, this is a visualization that was created, I think, in 2015 or 2016. I saw it when it first came out, and it's amazing. And it actually started making the rounds again most recently with Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. And I, I think it's a fantastic visualization. But I love it. I spent some time with it on Monday, digging in a little bit deeper. And I realized that this is a great example of practicing a lot of these things that make the process of data visualization transparent. Um, so first of all, you jump into the, the tool and right away it's telling you what the map's not representing, what the weaknesses are, what the limitations are with this data. Um, it also is encouraging people to connect with them. If there are errors or ways to improve the data, they're encouraging that conversation with the community. So we can absolutely jump over and go to the map we can kind of zoom in here and uh, maybe we'll look at, I'll put some labels on here so we can see Ann Arbor. Um, but this is telling us who, um, what tribes were in these regions. 
You can also focus more on specific territories, languages, and treaties. But we can kind of hover over Ann Arbor, and we can see what tribes uh, were in this area. So I'm like, it's a very cool, powerful tool. But what I like about it is, and actually I'll just jump over here so I can quickly zoom through this, is that you know, right from the get-go, it tells us what the limitations are, right? It encourages connecting with them. So there's kind of that conversation component to it. When you dig in a little bit deeper, they've published a teaching guide where it's like, please think critically about this visualization. So uh, you know, who defines national boundaries? What sources are being used? What are the biases in those sources? So they're presenting this information, but then they're also telling you, think critically about this. Um, I also really appreciated when I dug into kind of the about us the people that are creating the visualization are people from the community. So we don't have outsiders collecting all of this data and creating a visualization about a community and there's no voice at the table from that community. So I thought this was a really, really fantastic example that kind of highlights all of those ways to have kind of more ethical and thoughtful data visualizations. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was gonna talk now about sort of um, choosing visualizations and I feel like when I get invited to speak, especially um, to like undergrads and stuff like that, I'm oftentimes people, I encourage me to say like, or they ask me like, oh, can you just like give the students something so that then they'll always know what type of visualization to like use with their data? And my answer is usually no, I can't do that. Um, and a lot of it is for all the reasons I think that Kate was talking about is that there are all these sorts of complexities and you really have to know the data in order to sort of choose the best representation or the most sort of transparent representation. So there are, um, oh, it's the wrong way. There are, I'm sure a number of you have seen these sort of like chart chooser graphs. Um, and I think they're, you know, they're helpful. This is one, I, I've seen this, I don't know, how many people have seen this one before? Maybe a black and white version. I like spent an hour trying to figure out the provenance of this and I have no idea where it's originally from. So apologies if, what's that? Oh, okay, can you, yes, I'd really appreciate that. So hopefully none of you were the ones who made this that I didn't cite, but if you wanna. Um, but you know, it's, I mean, I think there's, there's something that's helpful about it, right? Because you can see all these different types of graphs and it, it is helpful to sort of have a kind of a, a repository of types of graphs. Like I was meeting with someone and they were looking at sort of all of these metrics, trying to look at different metro areas and trying to figure out how to represent their sort of this, this kind of uh, high dimensional set of metrics they had. And, and I said, well, maybe you should make a heat map. And they had never seen a heat map before. So I showed them one and they were like, oh, this is perfect. I can actually show you know, all of this. And so just having this kind of, you know, like, oh, I could make a stacked area chart or, you know, a, um, what is this, a circular area chart. And, you know, some of these I think are better graphs than, than others, but just sort of having in your mind um, a kind of a, a set of graphs that you might make might be helpful. Um, here's another one from Stephanie Evergreen. And I think the thing that's sort of nice about these, these two taxonomies is they kind of say, okay, you know, if you're interested in comparing things or distribution, you might look at these or, um, or the evergreen one, you know, if you're looking at um, showing survey responses or comparing to a target, here are some things that you could do. But I think, you know, these are sort of a helpful starting off place, but I think there's a, we can do a little bit better in terms of trying to think about how to sort of choose graphs and, and make it sort of respond to the data and the, the you know, the, the stories that are being represented by the data. So I think one of the things that's really important to, to sort of know about your data and your visualization is what sort of relationships are you interested in showing? So here are just a few we might be interested in. You know, we might know that there's some sort of simple kind of linear relationship in the data that we want to, to explain. There might be some you know, temporal change. We want to show change over time. There might be something spatial, right? We want to know where things are and where things are in relation to each other. And then oftentimes, I think this is a big one that I, I run into and that it sort of creates a lot of possibilities to do data visualization well and bad, is hierarchical relationships. So just relationships where you, know, you might have individual cases and then they're part of one group and then there's another like group and trying to choose the levels at which you might aggregate data up to you know, by like gender or something like that or by location or something. So choosing how to sort of aggregate your data. Um, and then finally, there are other sorts of relationships, like network relationships, where we might make some sort of network visualization. So just having an idea of sort of the shape of your data and what it's, what it's saying and what the interesting relationships are can be really helpful. 
because a lot of the, the sort of the graphs that we might choose are really kind of dependent on these types of relationships. So these are two really simple um, graphs showing some data about melanoma. But right, you know, it seems sort of obvious, and I think it's it's because maybe you know we've been most of us have been at least working with data enough that right that because this is showing change over time, this should be a line graph, right? It, you know, it, you could obviously make each of these into a bar chart, but it's a little bit harder to read because you know this sort of line graph lends itself to change over time. Whereas even though these are sort of like age is kind of like dates for individual people, right? It makes a lot more sense here to have this data in bins and shown as a bar chart because we're looking at groups of people based on age. So even just sort of, you know, this kind of this process of, of sort of thinking about the data and the appropriate ways to represent it can be really powerful. I think one of the other problems that, you know, working with data visualization that I oftentimes run into is, is a, mis, mis, a mismatch between the complexity of the data and the complexity of the chart that's chosen, right? I oftentimes, you know, oftentimes, I feel like there's very little data that's in the middle. It's either like data is very simple, you know, and you have like three data points and it's really hard to say anything interesting in visual form, or it's so complex that no matter what you do, it sort of just looks like this kind of like hairball of data and you can't pull anything out of it. So really trying to figure out sort of, you know, ways to sort of manage the sort of complexity. So this is, um, this is actually, this one's Kate's, I don't remember what this, what is it showing? Uh, so it's pulling data from an electronic health record, and then you just have kind of the different <coughs> problem categories, and then it's a, some type of network. Yeah, so it's some type of network um, with medical <laughs> data. Um, but you know, we can sort of by, you know, this one sort of lends itself to this certain complexity. Even maybe it's good, we don't know what it is. We can just look at it structurally. And you can see, you know, there's a, there's a cluster here, but, you know, adding just a few more connections, it quickly becomes really difficult to sort of see what's going on. One of the other things that, that I run into a lot, and I have some background in, in GIS, is people who are interested in making map-based visualizations. And I think maps can be really, really powerful, um, like Kate was talking about with the, the um, Jon Snow map. You know, in, a, in addition to the, the sort of the politics of this map, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, that seeing this data spatially, so seeing, right, the pump and the number of people who died from cholera around each of the pumps was what ultimately allowed, you know, him and the medical sort of um, establishment in London to figure out what was going on, right? Like, I mean, you could have, he could have done a sort of a spatial statistical analysis to figure out, figure this out, but it's, it becomes really clear when you sort of see things spatially. And so there are all sorts of things that we can see when we, when we put them in space. But I think one of the, the sort of the problems that happens with putting things in space is right that you essentially you lose the ability for the X and the Y to communicate anything else. So really, you know, once you start working with polygons like this, then the only, you only really have one more variable that you can show, right? So I oftentimes see when I'm working with, um, with students that, you know, they'll have some spatial data and they'll say, oh, it's spatial, I have to make a map. But if you actually, you know, took this and made this like a scatter plot or something like that, and you could even, you know, color it by like region or something like that, you can actually show a lot more variables. So being cognizant of when it is that making a map is actually telling you something or there's something really interesting spatially going on. Like here's one, right, where we're looking at um, how much snow before America cancels school. And right, you can see <laughs> there's, yeah, although they should have like U of M here and it should just be like, you know, 10 feet or something like that. Um, but right, there's, there's really very clearly a spatial dynamic going on here that tells us something interesting. And so if we took all these counties and put them on a scatter plot, I think it wouldn't tell the story as, as convincingly or as interestingly um, as this one does. So I think just being you know, cognizant of the sort of the appropriateness of making a map can really go a long ways in choosing a sort of visualization that you're working with. Um, sometimes 3D visualizations can be helpful because it sort of gives you this, this extra dimension, but oftentimes they can be sort of difficult to really see what's going on. Um, and especially if the third dimension doesn't communicate any additional information, um, I think it's generally a bad choice. So it's not telling us anything more here. Um, there are also volumetric visualizations, which some people in the sciences work with. Um, it's just to say that, you know, there are lots of different types of, of visualizations that one can choose from. 
Um, one other sort of type of visualization, I, I think, you know, most of this has been sort of kind of broad, but I, I really like to sort of tell people about small multiples. How many people have heard of small multiples before? Okay, uh, just a, a few of you. Um, so this is a term, I think it comes from Edward Tufte, but the idea predates Tufte. Um, you know, and I think there's a, a tendency when working with sort of especially temporal data, and this is similar to this sort of, uh, I hope I can see this without paying for the New York Times, okay, we're okay, um, is, you know, when you have sort of temporal data, there's, there's people think like, oh, I should, should make a, an animated visualization of it or something. And I think, you know, these animated visualizations look really cool, but the problem is that we're so much better at seeing things spatially than we are remembering things, right? At least I am. So, you know, by the time, so this is showing drought. So by the time it gets to April, I don't remember what December looked like. So I think, so here, let me show you another one from the New York Times that they use these sort of small multiples, right? So this is showing drought in June by county. And so, right, you could easily imagine this being animated as well. Like they could just take each of these and animate it. But by using space instead of time to communicate this information, our eyes can sort of jump around, right? And immediately, you know, 1934 jumps out sort of when the Dust Bowl is really going. And so, you know, I think the, the I, I feel like I recommend small multiples to people so much because they come in and they say, oh, you know, I've got these like five dimensions and then it also like changes over time. And I'm like, why don't you just make five different graphs for, you know, the different time periods you're looking at. Um, and oftentimes that can be a really convincing way. And the other nice thing about this is, you know, you can put it in a journal article or, you know, something that's going to be in print. Let me go back into presentation mode here. The other thing, you know, that I think is, is good to think about is whether or not visualization is even an appropriate way to present your data. Um, so, you know, this, this chart on top, right, this is probably telling us something interesting. Um, is the bottom one, do you all like it? Or... <laughs> I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't like it very much. Um, it's, you know, but it does have data. The data, it's just across the entire x-axis, it's zero. Um, you know, and so I think this is actually a good example where like a sentence probably would have been much easier to interpret than, you know, than a graph. And so that's just to say, you know, that, that maybe a slightly comical example, but, you know, really sometimes even just sort of describing the data is actually more powerful than trying to make a visualization of it. Um, I think, am I doing okay? Okay. Um, I wanted to, to sort of show you all, has, how many people have seen, seen this graph? A fair number of you. Who, who is this by? Does anyone remember? Florence yep, Florence. And who is Florence Nightingale? Uh, the the yes, she was, a, I think I heard a statistician or demographer as well. Is that was? <laughs> okay, so she was oftentimes, you know, she's just referred to as a nurse, but she was also a statistician and a demographer. She started modern nursing practice, and, and she also made some, some really compelling visualizations. And so these were ones she, um, when the British Army was fighting in the Crimean War, she got a hold of data based on um, uh, soldier deaths. And so the, I believe the red is um, battlefield deaths. Let me make sure I have that right. Uh, it's so hard to find in here. Uh, oh yeah, so red is battlefield deaths, black is all other causes, and then blue are what she calls zymatic diseases, so what we might know as infections. Um, and I think this is a really good example of the, the Tukey quote that, um, uh, that Kate showed, is that really, you know, the army was so focused on winning the war on the battlefield that they, they weren't really invested in sanitation or hospital practices. And so she took this data to the army and said, look, you know, you're actually losing the war in the hospital. And in you're losing the war to bacteria more than you're losing the war to, you know, to the other, so, uh, other army. And so she, you know, took this and, and convinced the, um, the army to invest, I mean, based on the data as well as the visualization, to invest in nursing and sanitation practices. And I think one of the things that's so compelling about it is, um, you know, these sometimes have different names. I usually call them a coxcomb chart, where the, you know, it's like a pie chart, but the, the data is actually the, the length or the, the, the length of the pie, you know, pie wedge out. 
And she, and, you know, she had this data. She knew it was years, so it kind of went around like this, and, and she created these. And I think if you want to, you know, get good at data visualization, one of the best things you can do is really to look at these examples from the 19th century, because there's this explosion of, of data, you know, the, the Du Bois ones that Kate showed, these ones, um, Charles Menard, some of these other people. Um, but they didn't have Excel to say these are the 10 charts that you should choose from. So they're really, you know, they're inventing, uh, like William Playfair, you know, invented, invents the like bar chart sort of around this, this time as well. And they're really, you know, looking at the data and coming up with a representation. And I think that that is, is much more powerful than, you know, some sort of chart chooser or Excel sort of telling you what to, what to use. So, um, let me, I'll just go over this, this really, really quickly before I hand it back over to Kate. Um, but I love this book by um, Jacques Bertin. Has anyone heard of Jacques Bertin? Like one person. Okay, great. I'm so excited. I get to introduce you all to my favorite French cartographer. Um, so he was a, a cartographer working in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote this book in, that was published in 64 in France called A Semiology of Graphics, where he really tries to sort of break down this kind of this language of making charts and graphs and maps and stuff like that. And it's sort of this beautiful coffee table book. But the thing I really love about it is this sort of this, this schema that he comes up with to describe data visualization. And so he says, okay, so if we're looking at a two-dimensional visualization, you have two positional variables. You have X and Y, or you know, if it's polar coordinates, you have R and theta, but you essentially have two positional variables. And then you have six retinal variables is what he called them. So you have texture, color, uh, value, so he separates out, usually I think we think of color and value as being one, but I think it's really smart the way he separates it. So color is more for sort of showing categories and value is for showing quantity. We have size, shape, and orientation. And the thing I love about sort of showing students this is because I think oftentimes, you know, you have like a hundred dimensional data set and you want to say like, oh, how do I show all of this? But you show students this and it kind of, you know, cements the idea like you have to pick which variables you're going to use and which of these retinal and positional variables you're ultimately going to use. And then he makes this like data visualization of data visualization. And so here we have the, the six retinal variables, and here we have the, the sort of the four, he calls them levels, but they're essentially things you can show. So the first is association. We can see when things are similar. Selection, we can see when they're different. Um, so those are sort of qualitative variables. Order, we can see when things are bigger or smaller. And then quantity, we can actually see some sort of ratio between them. So we can see something's twice as large, three times as large. And then he sort of breaks it down. He says, okay, if you want to show quantity, Size and the positional variables are only the really one, only really the only ones that will do it. Value and texture will show you order, but they're not really gonna. With value, it's really hard to see when something's twice as um, large as something else. And then color can only really show selection, and shape can really only show association. So I find this to be so much more powerful than a taxonomy because it's less, you know, like these are the ten charts, but you can come in here and you can say, okay you know, I really want to show these three variables. Which ones am I going to use for the positional variables? Which ones am I going to use for the, you know, retinal variables? And then you can also decide, you know, if they should be polygons, lines, or points. Um, so not that you all have to, you know, rush out to read um, Jacques Bertin's work, but I, I think that this can be a little bit more nuanced than looking at some of these chart taxonomies in, in terms of taking your data um, and, like Kate was saying, try to tell these really interesting stories. Microphone's very heavy. I'm afraid it's gonna fall out of my pocket. Ugh. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna cover some basic design principles. Um, I might zoom through this a little quickly so Justin's got time to actually um, show you some, some cool tools. Um, so these are some basic principles um, based on all sorts of studies where people um, have examined how our brains process visual information. So one thing to think about is visual weight when you're creating your charts and graphs. So when I look at this, the first thing my eye is drawn to is probably these, these larger things. That means that that has a more visual weight to it. And so that can kind of influence where your viewers, your consumers are going to pay attention to first. So you can see things like uh, when they do eye tracking um, studies, 
you'll see like where the red is, that's where the eye is drawn to the most. Um, and so that's just an important thing to think about as you're kind of designing and formatting um, your visualizations. Uh, the text weight and positioning also plays a big part in this. So I have this little uh, screenshot here. So the your eyes here is going to likely be the first thing that you look at because it's the biggest and boldest text then your eyes will naturally navigate down to the smaller than here. And then at the last step, isn't that fascinating down at the bottom? So the, the, the weight of the text and the size will influence how your viewer navigates whatever visualization you create. Contrast is another really important thing to consider. Um, not only is this important for people with visual impairments, but it also just makes the, the image a lot easier to view. So that's exactly the same color tan in the, the middle square, but when it's on the green background, it's a lot easier for us to see and to process. Size and shape is another thing to consider. So on the left-hand side, I actually downloaded all the, the text from the ICPSR program and dumped it into a, a word cloud here. So you can see things like the size and shape of the individual words indicate, in this case, the, the frequency that those things come up in the program. Um, this is some type of budget data. I can't remember what it is exactly. Um, but you'll see that, again, the size and shape of these circles indicate something in addition to the color. Uh, again, color, value, and hues makes a big difference. Um, so this is a very complex visualization. It's actually uh, easier to navigate as a 3D um, visual. But we can kind of see there's some additional information that the color is giving us. Whereas if you're printing this maybe in a, a journal where they don't have full color um, images, we're losing it when it's grayscale. There's that additional level of detail and information that we're just not seeing uh, when we're missing the color. There's some standard best practices when it comes to combining colors. So something like this with the, the red and the green, it's just incredibly painful. Sometimes you'll even see like the words appear to wiggle a little bit. So you have to be thoughtful when you're combining the colors. Um, so it, it's actually pleasant to look at and engage with your visualization. Uh, so some standard best practices with color, you want to avoid using all the colors. Anything more than about six colors is, is kind of difficult for your brain to process. You may also want to play around with color categories, so combining color and hue. So maybe you just pick one range of red, and so the dark red means one thing and a lighter red means another thing. Um, you should also consider colorblind viewers and grayscale versions, like the example I showed you before. Um, in other words, don't do this. This is my favorite. This is my favorite terrible uh, data visualization. It's, it's a real visualization. Um, it's some type of visualization about banana exports. Um, there is just so much going on with this visualization that my brain cannot even handle it. There's some, there's some type of quantity. I have some type of geography down. And then there's some date range. And then there's some awful like banana image as the background. It's, it's like all the, the worst things you could possibly do in one visualization, so don't do that. Um, this is another great, for the sake of time, I won't jo jump over and show it to you, but this is another great website. It's pulled, especially if you're doing any type of teaching. Again, thinking about like providing this instruction to students or out in the community, but what's great about this is it pulls out the top 10 worst graphs in scientific publications. Uh, it will give you the article, the figure, and then it provides some discussion about maybe what went wrong, what you could possibly do better. Um, this is one of the examples they provide. So pie charts are always really challenging. Like our brains have a very hard time with um, determining an area, and especially when there's like curves involved, and then throwing 3D into the mix, is, it, it's awful, right? And so this is one of the examples they provide. Um, oh, so another example with the pie chart. So when you look at this, again, your brain has a hard enough time with that 2D. The actual values for this are 82% blue and 18% orange. But when you convert it to that 3D format, it really, it really challenges your brain. So that when we look at that 3D version, it's the same exact visualization, our brain interprets the blue as 91% and the orange area as 9%. So 3D pie charts, not so great. Uh, this, is a very, 
It's a very funny uh, Tumblr page, W2F Visualizations, where they pull in um, visualizations in, in uh, you know, news stories and TV, and this is uh, one example. But what's nice is they actually provide, in this case, it's providing some recommendations. So maybe removing the meaningless color scale. So at first you glance at that and you're like, oh, like, the dark blue teal must mean one thing and the greenish teal means it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it might, there's nothing that tells us, but maybe getting rid of that would be great. Um, and then we can look at this, the greater than 40 section is 76.5, but it almost looks like the same, I mean, 42.8. So there's some, there's some problems with this. And so I love showing bad visualizations because I think you learn a lot more from things that go wrong than things that go right. Um, so that's a great resource. That's, that's another one. It's like, I'm, I'm sure I don't, <laughs> I'm sure there's another way to communicate this more effectively than this, right? Um, and I'm going to go back to this example because this was really, really cool. Back in, I don't know, 2012, that's me, uh, I went up to our North Campus. We have this, um, I believe it was called a cave when I went, but now it's called the um, Maiden. Um, it's this fully immersive 3D experience. And so you put these um, glasses on and there's a little controller. And so I was able to navigate this data set and it was amazing, right? I, and I completely lose that in this format, right? So just making sure you have kind of the right format for it. Um, but that's a very, very cool tool. Um, and then just kind of a quick check for your data. Can you understand the visualization completely in less than 30 seconds, right? If it's taking you a few minutes to kind of get through and process it, it's maybe too much, too much information. Maybe it's the wrong format. Maybe you haven't provided enough context. So that's kind of a red flag for me. Um, the squint test. You should be able to just kind of squint like you're missing all the finer points and just kind of quickly understand what is being presented. Um, Again, is it the best type of visualization for your data? And then are you providing enough context, including like title and clear labels to help your user understand what data you're trying to present? Um, there are some cool tools. There's so many, so many tools. But this is one that's um, very, very interesting. So about one in 20 people have some sort of color vision deficiency. So if you're creating a visualization that relies on a lot of like reds and greens, one in 20 people, won't, won't get that story that you're trying to tell. So this is a cool tool, it's very, very simple. You can just upload um, your visualization and it will show you there's a couple different types of um, color blindness so you can kind of pick um, from the three in the list and it will show you what it looks like. So if it's communicating the story that you're trying to tell, then you're good to go, but you might need to adjust the colors. Um, there's also some other really cool tools in you know, kind of the design world that help you pick out palettes of, you know, pleasing tones and hues. Um, and a lot of them will give you an option to select from a uh, color palette that's appropriate for folks with any type of color blindness. So this is just one, but there are lots and lots of tools out there. Awesome, so that gives you about 20 minutes for tools. All right. Great, so we're gonna wrap up. I think we have until 20 after, because you all need 10 minutes to get somewhere. Um, and so maybe just for like 10 or 15 minutes, I was going to talk a little bit about sort of tools and kind of you know, learning a little bit more about visualization. And then we will maybe have a little bit of time for, for Q&A. Um, you know, I think one of the, the challenging things about like working in data visualization is that people mean so many different things when they, when they say data visualization. Um, and I like to think of it sort of as a, as a kind of a, a spectrum. And so here on, on one side, we have these sort of these design issues that we've been talking a lot about today. Um, and I mean design very broadly. So, you know, literacy, making sure your, your graphs are readable. Statistics, you know, the ways in which you sort of aggregate data and present it. Um, graph types and then description, you know, choosing graphs and then this sort of this additional context in which the, the visualization lives. Um, and then here on the right, you know, I think we have a lot of, um, I don't know, uh, this is being recorded, I won't say that, never mind. Um, we have a lot of the sort of the really fancy things that people like to invest in, like um, 3D environments, you know, using graphics processing units to, to go through billions and billions of rows of data, 
um, high resolution displays and that kind of thing. Um, but I think sort of in the middle, and, and this is sort of one of the, the kind of the real sort of skills part of, of data visualization computationally, is the processing. Like, you know, there's, there's all these design questions that go into data visualization, but I really think, you know, 80% of data visualization is actually just like getting your messy data clean in, in the right format so that your visualization software will, will actually show it. Um, and so being able to, you know, be sort of proficient with munging data and data scraping and, you know, and, and like, taking a, a small subset of it, looking at that, taking a different sort of slice of it, um, is a lot of the kind of the computational work of, of data visualization. Um, and not to say that, I don't think, you know, this is not by, by any means, I think, the most important. Like, I really think a lot of the aesthetic stuff and the, the questions about representation and communication and context are, are super, super important. But like, this is the thing that you end up spending like hours and hours and hours doing, just kind of getting your data clean and stuff like that. So the, the more proficient you can be at that, then the more time you can spend on the, the sort of the exciting, um, important stuff. So just, I'm sure a number of you are familiar with a lot of these tools, but just um, to give you a sense of some of the tools um, that we like to use, you know, I think a lot of, if you, if you really want to be able to take data and make sort of any visualization out of it, you, you sort of end up in, in some sort of scripting language. Um, which oftentimes is R or Python, or if you're making these sort of interactive web ones, um, JavaScript, sometimes not a scripting language, but sometimes you can do some stuff with Tableau. But you know, I think if, if you really want to like sort of get into the data and play around with it, you, you end up sort of using some kind of scripting language. Um, network visualization sort of has its own suite of tools. So I really like Cytoscape, which comes out of the biomedical sciences. Some people use Gephi. Um, but I think Cytoscape is a little bit more robust and a little easier to use. Um, there's also an, an old Slovene one called Payek from the University of Ljubljana. Um, that's still, I think, one of the best for network analysis, but its, it's visualization capabilities are a little bit limited. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other tools that people use um, for mapping GIS or this sort of this new suite of kind of cloud GIS light things like um, Esri Online or Cardo or Mapbox. Um, some people use MATLAB. I don't use MATLAB, so I don't know anything about that. Um, OpenRefine is this Google product for doing some kind of data cleanup. It can be nice, especially if you have a bunch of misspelling. This is like. I use it for this one thing exclusively because it's so fast, is if you have data with like different spellings in it, it will automatically cluster your data and let you choose how to, um, to do that. So that can be really helpful. And then D3 and Leaflet are sort of, uh, D3 is this one Mike Bostock created. He was at the New York Times. And a lot of the kind of interactive web stuff you see that's not Tableau is made in D3. Um, and then Leaflet.js is an, uh, an open source uh, JavaScript mapping software so you can make these kind of slippy maps um, and I use that one a lot. So there's a lot out there um, but you can do a lot with these tools. So I was just gonna, gonna maybe really quickly to sort of wrap up, I just kind of wanted to show you because I, I think one of the things, you know, that that's hard to teach about data visualization is just the way in which you just sort of have to take the data and keep kind of playing with it and sort of seeing um, what shakes out if you kind of make things look differently. So I, how many people have used Social Explorer? I imagine quite a few. Um, I, won't, I won't sort of demo it right now, but I really like teaching Social Explorer because of the fact that you can like get data in so quickly, you can change the breakpoints on maps, you can change the colors, you can, you know, sort of you can compare different data sets. So it's a really nice tool, I think, especially for teaching undergrads, because they don't have to do any programming, the data's clean, and they can really just sort of play around with it. Um, but another one that I, I like teaching, and I, and I wanted to show you all really quickly, is raw graphs. I don't know, how many people have used raw graphs? Okay, a couple. It's not like, I think, the best tool in the world. It's a little, you know, it's point and click, and it has like 10 graphs you can choose from. But I like how easy it makes it to sort of play around um, with data. So I'm gonna try really quickly. I have some, I'm just kidding. Two years ago, Kate and I gave, we, did anyone come to our presentation two years ago? Okay, only one person. All right, great, then I'm gonna use the same data we used two years ago. Um, I have another one about chickens, but I really like this, um, this um, space flight data. So this is um, uh, a data set of all of the shuttle missions flowing from NASA, and it has the shuttle and the duration, hours, miles flowing, um, and then some other data. So I'm gonna just take this. If anyone else wanted to play along, I can show you right here. It's just tinyurl.com slash icpsr2019. 
And then uh, I'm going to take it over to rawgraphs.io. Just click use it now. And so the thing that's really nice about this is you can just take a, a CSV of data and just paste it in. Hopefully you can paste it in. Oh, I think I used the Mac keys just a second. There we go. So it brings it in. It tells you it's OK. And then the thing that I kind of like about this is that it has sort of some of the like more fun, exciting graphs that you know, are harder to do in Excel or something like that. So I'm going to just really quickly, I'm going to make one of these uh, sunburst graphs. So you just click on the graph that you want. And then you can scroll down. And then it has um, this, this sort of drag and drop interface. So you can take any of the columns here, and then you can drag them to all of the different, um, you know, if we were to use Bertin's language, the different uh, positional and retinal variables. So, um, so this one you can sort of, you can use a different kind of hierarchy. So I'm going to just put uh, shuttle and then the, I'm going to put the mission. So here I'll show you. So, so it'll first make like a pie chart for the shuttle and then one for the mission. And then I'm going to put, um, should we do duration or distance? OK, thank you. And then, let's, and then we'll color it by shuttle as well. It's OK. And then it just makes this, this really kind of nice graph. So you can see here what it's done is it's, you know, it's, it's split it up by shuttle, and then it has all of their different missions with the mission name. Um, you know, and, and there are things that instantly jump out, right? Like the Challenger didn't go on very many missions. Um, and you know, Columbia, which, um, which also had a, a disaster, but I think much later, you can see how many more missions it went on. Um, you can also sort of see you know, Columbia, which is one of the older ones, has, I think, significantly longer missions than like the Challenger and some of the other ones. Um, but the thing I like about this, you know, it's, it's usually if I'm making visualizations for like presentations, I tend not to use this. Although sometimes if there's some specific graph, you can see there are a bunch of different choices here. I might use it, but I really like it for sort of teaching and, and talking about data visualization because it's so easy to sort of drag and drop things and you know explore kind of splitting up the data in different ways. And I think that sort of that iterative process is really kind of at the heart of, um, of data visualization. There are other tools that I think are, are really nice. I don't know if anyone's ever played with LEHDs on the map, but um, this is a data set where they have where um, people live and work. I think down to the block level, there's noise added so that you, know, you can't figure out where your neighbors work um, if they don't want to tell you. But you can make, um, it's really difficult data to work with, but you can make these labor and commuter sheds just by saying, you know, show me where everyone who works in Ann Arbor lives, and you get these kind of these beautiful um, maps out. And so I think these sort of tools where there's complex data sets with visualization baked into it can be really nice to sort of um, explore the data set and, um, and play with it. I actually, I tried doing a project where I use this data and like downloading it, these like 20, 30 gigabyte files for each state, trying to manipulate them. Like it was a multi-month process, whereas this is really nice. You can just sort of see what it, what it looks like. So here are a few additional resources. Um, and we have, I think, about 10 minutes for questions. But just sort of you know, in, in kind of conclusion, I think what we've sort of wanted to you know, leave you all with is just that, that data visualization is sort of this process that's, on the one hand, both technical, but also a question of sort of aesthetics and representation and what the data means and how you tell stories about it. And in order to sort of be you know, proficient in making data visualization, you have to kind of live in both of those worlds and go back and forth between the data and the story it is that you want to tell. So thank you all.